welcome to Outlaw Gamer Radio, the official podcast of OutlawGamers.com. This is the show where we live to play and play to live. I'm Brent Adams, joined by a man who is absolutely going to keep flashing his customers, no matter what Gabe Newell says. It's Mr. Lauren Baumgarten. Lauren! <laughs> What's up, Brent Adams? What's going on, my man? Uh, I will keep flashing my customers, and I would like to take this opportunity to apologize to you, my customers. <laughs> But thank you for your business. That's exactly right. Uh, how are you, buddy? How are you? I'm doing good, man. I'm doing very, very good. Yeah. Not been a super, uh, not been a super eventful week for gaming news, which I attribute to the fact that everyone who even knows what a video game is has been playing, is playing a 4. video game. <laughs> well, so <laughs> not everyone. There's seven or eight people who aren't playing it, yourself included. Yes, that's true. I'm not playing Fallout 4. You're not playing a lot of Fallout 4 this week. Not much. Uh, so anyway, that constituting the intro to the show, let's go into the garage and talk about <laughs> our first story. <laughs> you know, it was just this week that our listeners were saying how much they miss Epic Battle Cry, and that's the opening we come up with in a yeah. counter to that? I mean, listening to this show, can you blame them? No, I mean, that's true. That's a true them? story. That's a true story. I miss it, too. Uh, I do, too, sometimes. Uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided has been delayed to August 2016. Hey, this is kind of like an epic battle cry story right here. We're talking about a game delay. <laughs> Trying to come up with something to say about it. Like every epic battle cry, 200 plus episodes and 200 plus episodes of our show, there's something to do with, with the game delay on it. With the game being delayed, yeah. Uh, this one's pretty significant, though. This is six months? Well, yeah, it, it is. It's, it's gotten pushed back to uh, Deus Ex Mankind Divided is... Now been delayed until August twenty third, two thousand and sixteen. So yeah, it's it's a hefty, it's a hefty pushback for a game that's already experienced some hefty pushback. Ha <laughs> ha! Uh, I really, I got nothing to say about this. I mean, like it again. It's one of those delays that that I can't quite muster my my will to be upset about it because I'm like I still have Metal Gear Solid Five. Uh, Mad Max, Witcher 3, Batman Arkham Knight, and Fallout 4 to get to, you know, before August 23rd next year To name year a now. few, and you may be adding Just Cause to that, too. Yeah, and, or Battlefront. I mean, anything could happen. Anything could happen. But, but anyway, but yeah, what do you think? Six months? No, I mean, you know, whatever. It's the same old story. I, I do, I, you know, I applaud their honesty. They say in this article outright, like, we started playing the game from beginning to end, which is what you do in this phase. Yeah. And essentially, he doesn't say this, but he's like, essentially, we realized that it, it needs some damn work. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I applaud them for doing it. I still, still, how, we've been doing this for five years, Brent. I still don't understand how the fuck you announce, announce a release date when you don't know when the game is coming out. But, uh, you know that, that's I, I, it's, you don't it's know part how of our broken the process is it's part of our industry that I just that I that I will never uh, that that I just do not understand. So yeah. I mean, it, how do you get to two months before and delay for six months? Is what I wonder. But I don't know. Maybe it's one of those things you just can't like you can't know until you've been inside the process yeah. and understand you know like really how it works. I mean, obviously, you know, you and I can, uh, you know, I think we know enough about game development that we can kind of imagine what the process is like, but maybe it's just vastly, vastly different actually doing it than what we imagine knowing about it. <laughs> I was, I was going to insert a joke there about uh, knowing it versus doing it, but I, I think I'll, I'll leave that one laying on the floor. <laughs> um, so yes, Brent, uh, yep. Deus Ex Mankind divided, delayed. We'll talk more about it over the summer, potentially delaying it into the holiday season. Uh, <laughs> I don't really when they care. Delay it to October. I really year. don't yeah. care, Brent, because this next story uh, is about something that I believe is going to come out in the first quarter of next year. I'm believing with my heart of hearts that consumer VR will actually come out. I'm not talking about the the um, the headsets. Uh, the well, I, I mean, I am talking about the headsets, but I'm not talking about the Samsung Gear VR that's out currently. Okay, I'm talking about the full fledged plug it into my PC headset supposed to come out in Q1 of 2016 from Oculus Rift. Um, among potentially others. But this is uh, mm -hmm. the next up story, Brent, is Crytek uh, has released on Steam right now uh, a, a demo, uh, basically. A VR, they're, it's a VR, they're calling it a VR game, but it's really just a demo. It's pretty short. Uh, called Back to Dinosaur Island. Uh, it is now available on Steam. You need to have at least the DK2. So I haven't actually seen it in virtual reality. Right. But watching the video, Brent, it looks freaking awesome. It ought to, considering what the minimum requirements are. 
<laughs> it did make me which, for a second. Which are not slight. I, I, be, I believe, did it not say uh, GTX 980? GTX 980. Yes. And a Core <laughs> i7 2600. Yes, because they're trying to and render... 16 gigs of RAM minimum because they're minimum <laughs> they're trying to render uh to you know two images at 75 frames per second of something that is the crytek engine and looks as yeah. up to date as almost anything else i've ever seen and so you it's can intense. imagine i mean you know you're trying imagine trying to render like battlefront or any of the i was going to say fallout but that doesn't really apply here but any of the sort of more modern video games with really incredible graphics trying to render them twice at 75 frames per second yeah. you can imagine that the video card that i just bought Three months ago, might be out of date. It it might not it might not work for. But I guess the good news is is that if 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 there are VR demos that are running really really well on really expensive hardware right now, another eighteen months from now, it's going to exactly actually be right. somewhat reasonable. And another eighteen months after that, it'll be cheap. And we will be seeing stuff of this quality. I highly encourage people to go watch it because you'll watch it and you can just imagine if you've ever been in VR at this point. Uh, but even if you haven't, you can imagine how cool that would be to be uh, inside of something that's rendered that beautifully. It looks incredible. All righty. So moving on to the next story in the garage, uh, which kind of is a, it goes back to uh, to our intro. But Steam has announced that they are going to be changing things up a little bit uh, moving forward with their. Well, I don't know if this is permanent, but certainly for the autumn and the winter sales, I suppose they could change depending on how people react to it. But they're no longer going to be doing daily deals and and flash sales and you might say to yourself well that's bullshit like that's where all the good deals happen but you haven't listened to the rest of what i'm about to say which is that whatever the lowest price that the game is going to be like whatever its theoretical price point would have been during the daily deal or a flash sale or something like that the game is going to be that price for the duration of the seasonal sale on steam so Steam's like, why are we bullshitting here? You know that we're going to sell you like every Grand Theft Auto game ever made for ninety eight cents. Here it is. Like you don't have to. You don't have to wake up at three in the morning. You know, so you can get on your phone and and snag it in a flash sale. You you know you don't have to. You don't have to to bum out of that meeting that you got at work that runs all day long. That's preventing you from getting the daily deal you need. It's just going to be ninety eight cents the entire deal or the entire sale. And isn't that better for everybody? Uh, yeah, I'll be curious to hear what their reports are after the sale, Brian, if they do share it with us, because uh, it certainly, I, th- I think, is better for us as as gamers. It gives us the time to address the sale when we have the time to do so and yep. know that we're getting the lowest prices, and should we wait, should I not, I don't know. Um, so I think it's great for us. I'm curious to see how it ends up for them, because I feel like that sort of that kind of engagement yeah. keeps people coming back every day during the course of the sale, and... Yep. Without it, you know, I feel like I'm going to look through it for an hour or so on the first day and not go back there. And, and I just wonder, uh, I, I wonder how that'll play out for them. But hey, man, I'm all for it. I think it's great news for us. I'm very curious to, to find out if you're right, because I've seen comments to that effect as well. And people are saying that, you know, those, those daily deals and the flash sales and all that, that's what, that's what keeps people coming back and checking the Steam sale every day and multiple times every day while it's going on and that the the sort of um the oh you know if i don't get it now i'll pay more for it which you know is like the time thing is a very big part of of you know the the sort of the sale mentality in in consumers that it might actually not be as impressive a sale as they had been in the past because the, the those things sort of generate excitement and like you're saying, sustained interest over the course of time. So I'm very, very curious too. I'm very curious to see how this goes for them and whether they keep doing it in the aftermath. Uh, for my own part, though, I haven't really gotten into like the Steam sales all that much in the last couple ones they've held because neither have I. I've kind of reached the point where everything that they have in their back catalog that I kind of wanted to get, I- I've got at this point. I agree with that. I- I'm in the same place, and so mm-hmm. I don't know. I, I as somebody who's who hasn't really participated in the, and, and I wonder if a lot of their player base is like that and if they're doing this sort of as a reaction to that because right. um, what I tend to do now is I look on the first day and I almost don't look anymore or barely check uh, at least I, I wonder if you know I, this time I will look through it and take a good long look through it and, and probably then uh, not go back to it but yeah it'll be interesting to see how it plays out I agree 
Okay, so hot on the heels of word that Microsoft is bringing Xbox 360 compatibility to the Xbox One, Sony has decided they've got to get them some of that, and so they're bringing PlayStation 2 emulation to the PlayStation 4. Wait, now that I now that I say those two things right next to each other, that almost makes no sense whatsoever. Why in the hell would Sony care about bringing PS2 games to the PS4, Lauren? Uh, you got me. <laughs> I mean, as far as I'm concerned, personally, I don't have an, I don't have the first idea. But the reality is, is that uh, Sony's got a, a pretty uh, strong fan base of a lot of their earlier games, and I think th- what they're doing is they're trying to bring it to the uh, PS4 through uh, emulation software. My guess is the PlayStation 4 is the first Sony, uh, according to the article, it's the first Sony console that doesn't have any backwards compatibility. That's true. Yeah, that's true. Um, so my guess is is that they're trying, you know, and this is something that Sony um, uh, members of the PlayStation Nation uh, really always want that backwards compatibility, and so I think this is Sony's attempt at, um, you know, drinking from the same pool. Even though what you're talking about is uh, they're drinking is from two a much thing. more diluted pool. Like Microsoft is drinking in the pool, like up on the top of the mountain. And then there's a second pool down that Microsoft is shitting in, and then there's the third pool that Sony's drinking from. Well, but I think people would argue, like, you know, for example, Brent, games like Eco and Shadow of the Colossus. Yeah. Uh, oh, wait a minute, actually. There were HD remakes of those. Yep. Um, so maybe, you know, some of the old God of War games, maybe. Oh, wait, oh, wait. wait. Those, there's, there's th- those have been remade. Too. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. There's, I, there's, there's the Metal Gear games. Oh, remade. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, what I, else is there? I, I'm not really sure, actually. It's a good question. So, yeah, I, I don't know. Like, I get this. And, and like, I don't want to poo-poo this too much. I mean, for people who were really, really just dying to play uh, Star Wars Jedi Fighter, all four of you, um, then that that's awesome. I mean, it is really cool and everything. But I don't know. Like, I just can't imagine. And I could be wrong. I mean, and, and like, I mean. I fucking love the PlayStation 2. The PlayStation 2 is still one of the best-selling video game consoles in history. It might be the, perhaps, I, I mean, like, like maybe like the Nintendo DS, but I think the PlayStation 2 might be the best-selling console in history. I mean, it was a, it was a beast, and that's awesome and everything, but I just, I don't know, like, is there really this intense heat of demand for PlayStation 2 games right now? I, I, I'm just, I'm not sure that there is, or at least... At least I don't know. I mean, maybe it's a if if it's a, they will build it or if Sony will build it, they will come situation where you know they open up some you know new area of the store and everybody loses their minds playing this stuff. But I don't know. Like I feel at least in my mind, and perhaps I'm naive, but I feel like backwards compatibility is most valuable to you at the launch of a new console when you're guaranteeing people you're going to be able to get the new thing and you're going to be able to enjoy all the stuff you're enjoying right now and then. You know, after a year or so, when good games actually start to come out for the new console, you can transition over. But I, I like that has been its value in my mind because it seems like the amount of things that you play from previous generation falls off dramatically after you know twelve to eighteen months. And so, and this applies to Microsoft as well. I'm just not sure if this big push for backwards compatibility right now is going to really make a difference. Yeah, you and I have talked about this before, Brent, when we talk about backwards compatibility because this isn't the first time. Uh, well, obviously, for both of them, it's coming up. You know, after after the device was after the uh, consoles were released for this generation, yeah. and, and I agree with you 100. percent I think you know a smart thing would be to have those running up and running at the beginning to sort of fill out that sort of um, gaunt that, that, library, that thin game catalog. That's exactly right, and, and bring it out now. I, I mean, I, I've said this before. It it, it 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 offers no value to me. I mean, if and if yeah. I. I may have played some of those when the PlayStation 4, because I bought the PlayStation 4 around when it first came out, um, ish. Uh, ish. And, uh, um, I, you know, I would have pl- probably play- played some of those games, but you're right. Now, I, I, there's no chance I will play any of those games. Okay, so now we're talking about sort of like backwards compatibility in general. Let's talk specifically about what the story is, which is that uh, the, the, the version of Star Wars Battlefront on the PS4 includes a lineup of bonus classic Star Wars games. Super Star Wars, Star Wars Racer Revenge, Star Wars Jedi Fighter, and Star Wars Bounty Hunter are included with Star Wars Battlefront. These are PS2 games that are running in emulation on the PS4. Is that a good idea? Is it a good idea to 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 go buy a Star Wars game and hey, here's a bunch of here's a bunch of cool classic Star Wars games that we're throwing in 
as a bonus that you can play. Is is that a worthwhile thing? Uh, for me, no. I mean, yeah. I, I think for some people it would be, but but for me, no. There's there's almost no games, particularly. Uh, there's very few games that I care about playing back. You know, going back and replaying from from that generation of gaming. You know, with a few notable exceptions. I would, and, and this isn't the same generation, but I would play Donkey Kong probably. For a little while, yeah. you know what I mean. I, I would play Dig Dug for nostalgia purposes, and some of those games like from my childhood. But really, I, 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 I don't know. I mean, even I'm I'm, I'm replaying uh, Uncharted right now, mm-hmm. which is probably the fourth time I've played it or something like that. Um, and even that, I'm somewhat questioning if I want to play. And it looks unbelievable, and it's playing fantastic. Plays fantastic, right? But there's very very few games, and uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, for some people, I think it has value, but. For a company to put a lot of money into making it happen, I think there's other places Sony could put their money. That would be of more value. I don't know. It, it, it's interesting. I, I, I have to admit that I do. I like the idea. Now, I, like, I'm not necessarily like into like the PS2 era of like Star Wars games. Like, there, there wasn't there wasn't a, as much there as say like the Super NES. Like, if if Star Wars Battlefront came with uh, like all three of like the Super Star Wars games for the you know, the NES. Uh, those side-scrolling platformers that that'd be great if it came with it, if it came with you know like a sandbox but functioning version of the original battlefront games for the ps2 I, you know I, I, that's cool whatever oh, so, great now you just open it up there's going to be comments about how many from from our listeners about how many people would actually be playing the old battlefront and not playing the new, the new one. Battlefront. <laughs> that's right but uh I, I like i guess that the, you know those things like entirely depend on whether you know like how much nostalgia you have for them or whatever but i will I will try to give credit where credit's due. I actually think the idea of throwing in classic games as a bonus with this, I mean, this is not the first time it's happened, but I do like the idea of that. It, it, it just, it's, it's such a specific thing that you got to be, you got to be on board for like, well, like Metal Gear games. Like, uh, I can't remember what it was that uh, came with, was it the special edition of, I want to say it was like snake eater or piece, or maybe, maybe it was that one of those collections that they did. I can't remember now, but uh, it seems like, like, either snake eater or peace walker like they did a version of that game that came with the original two metal gear games i i guess i mean yeah i don't know i mean i agree with you but i think it's great and i think there are people that would have value of it for it that for whom it would have value right. um i was thinking back like max Payne. yeah um but i went back and played the original max Payne, and it's, i loved that game but now it's too. just it oh, just man. doesn't it, it just didn't do it for me it's like Mechanics have advanced, the graphics have advanced, you know, all those sorts of things. And yeah, yeah I, I think it is. I do. I do think it is a great thing. But uh, uh, for me personally, not necessarily value. But I'm sure there's plenty of people out there for whom it would have value. And honestly, free shit is always good. You know who found out the hard way, Lauren? About you know, what you were, you were talking about, like where they include the classic games and everybody fucking plays the classic games and nobody gives a shit about the new game, you know who found out the hard way that that shit is true is George mm. Lucas because he did those individual releases <laughs> for the Star Wars movies and the, and the bonus disc was a laser disc transfer of the original theatrical cuts for A New Hope, Empire, and Jedi and every motherfucker on Earth went and bought that disc, cracked it open, and threw away disc one. That's right. Ah, man, that's, that, I think that's at this point that's actually become part of our lexicon. You've been, you've been Lucas'd. I've been Lucas, and he didn't even kiss me first. <laughs> All right, everybody, we're going to uh, visit the clubhouse and chat a little bit more about our main topic this week. But before we do, I'm going to kick it over to Lauren to bring us up to speed on the results of last week's poll question. Lauren? Yes, sir. What are the results of last week's poll question? Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, last week's poll, remember, guys, we were talking about the fact that Naughty Dog said they have no idea what they're doing for their DLC, and we were talking about the question of is that appropriate or not. And Brent posed a question to you all that read as follows. What's your take on Naughty Dog's absence of a plan for Uncharted 4's DLC? And here's how the answer shook out. Coming in way back in fourth place with 6% of the vote, it doesn't bode well. Sounds like they haven't even started thinking about it. Coming in in second pla- or third place, excuse me, at twenty eight percent, it's Naughty Dog and Uncharted. Therefore, I am not worried. And coming in tied for first place with thirty three percent of the vote, I'm glad they're focused on the main game. It will be, un- it will make Uncharted four and the DLC better. Uh, and also with thirty three percent of the vote, giving people the option to pay for something they haven't finished, excuse me, giving people the option to pay for something they haven't fleshed out is greedy. So really, two number one answers that actually split. Uh, the sentiment very distinctly. Um, 
people being glad that they're focused on the main game or thinking that it's bullshit that they're selling something that they haven't fleshed out uh, and it is greedy. And I don't know uh, which side I fall on that. I just ain't going to pay them until I know what the hell they're selling me. Yeah, that, that's basically my attitude. I, I guess my my feeling is they they can do whatever they want, but if they want me to pay for it, then you know show me what to, it is. They're gonna have <laughs> right. to show me. Yep. Show um, me, and then I'll pay. Maybe. All right, Brent. So, what is our topic for this week? The topic this week is all about pay me, pay me, pay me, pay me. Get less for what you're paying for, and then keep paying me. Kind of. <laughs> um, kind of. Kind of. Yeah, that's right. We're talking about EA. You know it. You know it. Now we got this. Uh, we've got this really interesting analysis article from Game Informer that is talking about the the profitability of digital sales. And the title of the article is EA's digital profit margins are twice that of retail sales and uh, why it matters to gamers. And the article goes on to talk about how the, the overhead involved in the retail business and in keeping product in the retail chain and all of that is, is obviously, I mean, there, there are different costs associated with digital distribution, but obviously the, the majority of the cost that goes into physical goods is absent in digital, digital goods sales. And how EA has, has really, really apparently made bank with the, uh, the transition to digital. And so the article goes into some some numbers and, and discusses a little bit, you know, just kind of the, some of the things that are not so obvious as far as the cost of marketing and selling a retail game, marketing being a big part of it, doing, you know, big cardboard in-store displays and all of that stuff, you know, things that, you know, people can put on in caps or put out on the floor to attract attention, just, you know, all of those kinds of, uh, all of those kinds of things, you know, down to basically setting aside a portion of the of the profits or the projected profits in order to in order to you know to possibly refund retailers if the game doesn't sell as well as it needs to and just that whole process of you know keeping a game out a physical game out on the sales floor if it's not selling all that well if they're not moving it really fast then that's taking up space that another product you know might want to be occupying because it is selling and you know just all of these things that are not necessarily uh, the, it's not at the forefront of at least my mind in terms of what costs money in creating a physical game, you know, manufacturing a disc, a case, packing and shipping it. So it's, it's a really interesting insight into how a company like EA views that process and why there's such a great incentive for them to keep charging you that same amount of money that you would pay for a retail game, but get a digital edition of it. Lauren, after reading this article, I'm just curious, what, what, what was your takeaway from it? I, I mean, you know, what, what was kind of like the headline for you other than the actual headline, which I just read a second ago? <laughs> I feel, Brent, like you're throwing to me because of uh, the financial implications that I bring to the conversation based, um, how do I say it, on my heritage. <laughs> Uh, and I'm not sure how I feel about that. We talking about money this week. Let's cut to Lauren. <laughs> well, Brent, uh, nice. So, um, it's, you know what I thought was really interesting, Brent, and that I was unaware of was what they call, uh, uh, they call it the reserve or the, the you know, they, so they were talking with a gentleman named Blake Jorgensen, who's a CFO over at EA. Yeah. And he talks about, uh, he said he reserves 20% of every sale, uh, for sales reserve that ultimately keeps the channel clean, the sales channel through promotional dollars for the merchant or for reserve refund dollars for the merchant, which is, if I understood it correctly from the article, Brent, means that when the when the um, stock isn't selling, the, the, the game stock that's in the actual physical retailer, uh, they will incentivize the retailer to help them clear off the shelves of that stock so they can make room for more. And so they will actually ins- refund money, f- the, 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 the publisher will, to the retail store so they can drop the price to the consumer and still make the money they need to make, which I thought was interesting. Yeah. And so when you talk about, you know, the first question that's going to come up with Brent, obviously is this sort and the, and the thrust of this article is this idea that they're potentially doubling their profit margins on each unit. Um, but the consumer sees none of that. Right. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a, a, a hidden thing that actually wasn't talked about at all in the article, which I think uh, has an impact on the market as well. And that is, 
it's not just doubling the profit mar- margin on a per unit sale based on the things that the article talks about. But additionally, I, I would have to imagine they're making significantly more money overall because the product is not resellable. So that disc that gets purchased from the publisher at 60 bucks and then potentially gets sold to another person for 30 or 40 bucks, and then that person potentially sells it to a third party for another 20 bucks, right? Right. All, that's all based off of one sale to the publisher and through the game store. But if the, the media is purchased digitally, there's no reselling that. And so those other two consumers have to go buy it on their own. Mm-hmm. Um, so, And I have to imagine that increases their profit as well. And again, we are not only are, are we not seeing uh, any of that uh, financial remuneration from this process, you know, I, I mean, even something small to incentivize us to buy digital, like knock five bucks off the game, and I bet you would sell more digital copies, even though they're making ten bucks extra, right? So they split the difference with the consumer and sell more digital copies uh, that way, and therefore prevent the resale of games. Um, but in many cases, Brent, and, and there was a, one of our listeners posted this today, was looking for Fallout 4, what has it been, two weeks since the game came out? Yeah. And found that the game was more expensive uh, digitally, which is often the case, because uh, especially the console manufacturers are very slow to drop prices uh, on their uh, product digitally. And so v- not only can you usually buy off of a Craigslist or an eBay and find the game cheaper just a few days or a week after the launch of the game, but very frequently the physical copies will go on sale like for Christmas, for example, where the digital copies will not, especially again on the consoles. And so he found that he saved, you know, 10 or $15 just by buying it physically instead of buying it digitally, which is often the case and is obviously completely illogical. So, you know, I think it's interesting. I, you know, I don't know what we could do about it other than not purchase games digitally and force the developers or publishers, excuse me, to incentivize us to purchase it digitally. But it does feel somewhat unfair. Now, that being said, I, I, I have to say, I bought a lot of games digitally, and I really like the convenience of just firing up my machine, whether it's the PC or the PlayStation, and having those games installed right there on the device. You know, it, it is. It's very convenient. I, I've, I've done it exclusively on PC. I think I've bought one physical game on PC since I've gotten back into gaming, and that was SWOTOR. I don't even remember the last time I bought a you know, physical PC game. Honestly, it has to be greater than five years at this point, at e- least. Everything else is just everything else is just you know like I buy the game on Steam and you know download it to my machine or 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 not you know just keep it in my Steam library. But um, I, I have been much much slower to that process on the uh, on the physical or excuse me on the console side where I I've bought almost exclusively physical games. The exceptions to that being. You know, like the PSN Plus games that uh, that they have every month. You know, obviously those are those are digital only, right? But every game that I've bought uh, outside of that has been has been a physical game. Now on the Vita, I've bought and I've bought and I've bought <laughs> I've bought uh, you know plenty of plenty of uh, you know download only games on the Vita. But it is interesting to kind of think about. To kind of think about, you know, like my consumer behavior in relation to this, and obviously the way that EA wants it to go, which which is digital sales, and you know, I don't so much have a problem with it. I I don't really have a problem with digital sales uh, in concept, but you know, the reason that I tend to, the reason that that I am so apt to buy them on Steam is like we were talking about the the Steam seasonal sales. There's often great price incentive to to buy uh, those yep. games digitally that the convenience of it is is another major factor but also the way that steam handles your content and you know you like you buy the game it's attached to your steam library and uh you know wh- you know whether it's naive or not but i have the expectation that i'm going to be able to play that game on any machine that i want to as long as i log into steam I can download that game and play it on, you know, this PC or the next PC or one ten years from now. And I have to admit that there is, I have a little bit, I have a little bit more hesitance, hesitancy, I think, on the console side because while I think that it has largely sort of caught up, but throughout most of last generation, you know, the uh, particularly Sony, I thought did a really really terrible job as far as selling you digital games. I don't think Nintendo's done that great a job. I think Microsoft was probably uh, the first console maker that really 
that really did it right. But it, it, it just felt like the, the console manufacturers were sort of like dragging their feet getting to that point because I don't know why. And, it, you know, like to me, like it filled me with a certain amount of distrust uh, or fear that, you know, I was going to pay for something that I was going to lose access to and that they were going to, you know, basically ask me to buy it again if I wanted to get it again. And so I think that is what really got me in the habit of buying console games physically and, I, and I've stuck with it so far. But also, I, you know, I've benefited from it because, you know, maybe twice every console generation, I'll just grab a bunch of games and I'm like, yeah, I'm never going to play this again. And I'll go and, you know, trade them in or something like that. So, you know, there's that there's that financial incentive for me to buy physical because I can, as you point out, I can I can make money off that process. Yeah, that's not that's no small affair, obviously, when you talk about. Uh, having the freedom with your game. And we, we certainly will hear, I think, from listeners who will comment on that idea of ownership that you talked about. Yeah. Um, you know, I did have my Steam account hacked at one point, and I, I lost it for a couple weeks, and the idea that all those games would be gone uh, somehow. Um, That's I, I do know. I do know that when I went to sell my PS3, um, I was looking at, you know, pricing and that sort of thing, and I thought it, there was a difference between if I had all those games that I owned, that, that I still owned, that were right there on my PlayStation 3 that I would never play again, but it, it would have increased the value of the console to be able to say, and it comes with these 10 games, you know, Uncharted and Batman and all that stuff, which I was not able to do. It, it did not add value to the sale of my PlayStation right. because I had bought them all digitally, and I will never use them again. And I think that's part of the, the for me, also part of the thing with um, Steam versus the consoles is, at least in my mind, um, and actually, this is what we've seen. Uh, but in my mind, once I get move on to the next console cycle, I'm not going to play the games that I have ever again. Whereas my my PC games, I might. And, and I, I guess now that I'm saying that out loud, the reality is, is I don't. I, I don't go back and play the games from three years ago, as we discussed earlier. Yeah. I just keep moving forward. So I guess that you know it's somewhat silly, but um, yeah, I, I do. I do wish that I do think that the fact that they're I mean, I think it's great that they're finding better ways to uh, to make money. You know that I, I feel like that should turn into some sort of benefit for the gamer, where DLC gets cheaper, um, or studio. You know, the model of making games are more able to support making games without having to do things like microtransactions. Um, but uh, um, ultimately, I think, and I, especially, I think the console makers could do better with a uh, better job of selling, supporting, downloading uh, digital games. But uh, I, I do think that something... I feel like some of this should be passed on to the consumer, and it just simply isn't. You know, one part of the article that uh, that was interesting, that I, and I guess I knew this, but I just I hadn't really thought about it, but they were talking about how when they sell digitally through the consoles, that maybe 30% of that price goes to the console manufacturer as... Uh, you know, it's basically like a transaction fee, a, a, a fee for, you know, you're making money through our hardware and our service. And so 30% is the tax you pay to, uh, you know, to play in our sandbox. And, you know, that, that, I mean, that's a relatively common thing, you know, like, you know, that's like, like if, you know, you sell apps on the iOS app store, you know, it's 30%, you know, that's, that's not, that's not an uncommon figure for that kind of, that kind of ecosystem. And, um, so, you know, with them taking, you know, despite the fact that they have fewer costs and everything associated with digital goods, uh, the fact is that, you know, it's 30% off the top going to to Sony or Microsoft or whatever. And so I, I wonder, with that being the case, uh, you know, d- is that the reason that, you know, that they are so that they are so reticent to, uh, you know, to discount those games or discount them as quickly as you were talking about, or, you know, is this complete bullshit? Because despite that fact, their, their margins are still twice that on digital as they are in physical goods. And so to hell with it all. I don't know, but yeah, it, it was, it was an interesting article to kind of get the, I, I just get the perspective, I suppose, of, uh, of a publisher like EA and how, how they view this shift into, uh, into digital sales. And I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely shifted. I mean, it was, it was nowhere, not that many years ago, and now I, I was trying to decide. I mean, I've I've bought more games digitally this year than I bought physically. So, 
you know that probably uh, that probably says something. I'm sure that I, I'm not the only one that's like that. And Likewise, I far and far and away. Well, and especially, and I was also thinking about you know we have a lot of uh, listeners outside of uh, North America, and you know they talk uh, uh, all the time about how it can be really expensive to uh, you know to import games into their country. I, I know some of our listeners from Australia have talked about that in the past, and uh, and you know some you know sort of like you know digital sales, like if you can if you can have like a you know like a like a North American PlayStation account that you can buy games on and play games on and everything that you can do so uh, in, in many cases more affordably than uh, going to a retail store so it's a uh, it, it's an interesting it's an interesting sort of uh, con- and continuing transition that uh, that we're going through as gamers and this article you know just kind of highlights you know some of the things from the publisher side that that uh, we often don't uh, don't think of or, or just ignorant of. That's right. And with that, Brent, I think we'll turn it over to the listeners. As usual, we want to hear what you guys have to say about the topic. I know we have some developers out there. I'd like to hear from the developers and what your feelings are on this, if you have any insight to offer as to uh, why maybe consumers don't get that discount or just in general what your feeling is on digital versus physical media uh, and do we deserve more of the fruits of the labor of the tree of the uh, digital distribution tree. Just tell us what you think. <laughs> Way to not save it. <laughs> and we're back on the road, and we're going to be talking about some games that got played this week, including Star Wars Battlefront, which I know you're all very excited to hear about. Oh, yeah. But first, we're going to hear from Brent. We're going to check in on his Tales of Ribaldry. In Metal Gear Solid Five. Well, I won't. Uh, I won't take too much time here uh, because I know we are very eager to get your thoughts on uh, Battlefront. But I have been playing uh, Metal Gear Solid Five, continuing to do that, and I'm gonna actually. I'm gonna be doing some Twitch streaming. I think this week I got a new. I got a new capture card. I got the uh, the Elgato uh, Game Capture HD60, which I had the old model, and and it worked fine and everything. It was great, but uh, it was limited to uh, to 1080p. 30 frames a second, which was fine last generation, but now that console games are actually running at, you know, 60 frames a second, it, uh, it was, you know, it was looking a little hinky. So I went ahead and upgraded. I sold the old one. And, uh, so I've got this new HD 60 and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm curious to mess around with it. I, I'm, I'm mostly capturing game footage off of it right now, but I'm curious about the Twitch functionality. And I'm going to probably be testing that out a little bit this week. And I, I just want to kind of AB compare it to, you know, streaming directly from the PlayStation using the built-in uh, Twitch share functionality. So, anyway, yeah, playing a little MGS. And if you uh, if you feel like joining me for the Twitch stream, you just uh, follow me on Twitter at Viking Brent, and I'm I'm sure I'll I'll make an announcement or something that I'm about to do it when I'm about to do it. Awesome. Also, um, I played a little bit of Fallout Shelter. I haven't played I've it. In, I haven't played it in a little while. But you know, they've been updating the game. Like they they did a big update in October and. They did uh, sort of a Thanksgiving themed update and all that, and the 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 October update was uh, was apparently pretty pretty big. They introduced a, b- a lot of new game mechanics and stuff like that. And uh, since I haven't been back to it in a little while, I'm going to start. Uh, I think I'm going to create a new vault and start playing that again. I have not played the Fallout Shelter. Yeah, well, and that's your loss. I did play a little Fallout this week, though. Well, okay, um, not much. I played a little bit more. Battlefront uh, came out on. Uh, Tuesday. Tuesday. I did not get it till Wednesday night, so I ended up playing a little bit more Fallout, um, but not a ton. I did play some Rocket League this week, Brent. Uh, I got into the um, some of the DLC with the square ball and the different things like weird gravity and time warp stuff. It was interesting. Um, you know, Rocket League is just Rocket League. It's always fun, and I'm just waiting for the hockey DLC <laughs> to play with the frozen ice. But mostly, Brent, I played Battlefront this week. So how is it? Um, well, I'm very excited to talk about it on the show uh, and have it be a kind of a one-sided conversation so all the people on the website will stop yelling at me. I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, it is. Uh, so here's the thing. It's, it, it's great, Brent, although I've had a bit of an up-and-down relationship in the last like couple of days. But um, there's a couple. So, so, so first of all, uh, the game is uh, the most beautiful game I've played Ever, it's unbelievably good looking, and seeing Endor and Hoth and Tatooine and Sullust uh, render—it's just—I mean, it's just absolutely gorgeous. I'm playing on PC, by the way. Um, okay. 
The game is absolutely phenomenal. Uh, there was a lot of talk. I don't know if you were reading the website sort of leading, uh, you know, in the first couple of days that it came out. There's a lot of talk. I had a lot of back and forth with folks on the website. Um, and and what, the sentiment that was being expressed is, is not much different than the sentiment that was being expressed in the gaming media at large, which is that the game is fun, but it lacks content. Yeah. Um, and uh, Aaron uh, B., who's one of our listeners that's on the website quite frequently, uh, kind of, and I kind of went back and forth. And, and I, t- I took issue, not, not with Aaron, but with all of the gaming media who's really harping on this lack of content and, and the um, audacity of EA and what they're doing with the uh, $50 DLC. And, and so I started doing some research, and, and I'm just really confused. Uh, I got really confused, and at this point, I'm really frustrated at the comments about how it lacks content um, without, without it being framed in the context of the fact that it is no different from Battlefield 4 or Battlefield 3. Right. Battlefield 4, but this game has, this game has 13 maps at launch, or 12 maps at launch um, with something like nine different modes or something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, Battlefront, Battlefield 3, Battlefield 4 had the same amount of maps. They both had the same $50 DLC season pass. Yeah. Both of them had four um, map packs in that DLC season pass. Each one of those map packs in all of those games included four new maps. Uh, in addition, Star Wars gets two additional maps uh, coming in December for free uh, from Je- the Battle of Jakku. Uh, so Star Wars uh, has exactly, if not more, maps and modes than Battlefield 4 and Battlefield 3. Um, so some people have taken issue with the lack of a single player. Uh, I-, I argue that Battlefield 3 and Battlefield 4 also had no single player. Now, they did. <laughs> and, and I'm not kidding. I mean, but you it think was I'm being worthless. A, it, it was 100% worthless, and I played them for no more than about 30 minutes each. And they were they were a joke. They were an absolute joke. And Star Wars does have a single player mode it's like a horde mode type thing yeah. and that you could do co-op but it which i actually have been enjoying playing with my friend but but even if you didn't and i totally get it if you don't because that's not a single player mode um uh, it is certainly no less worthless than the, the and i i mean this too the the absolute pieces of shit single player that they shoehorn into battlefield three and four battlefield w- was a multiplayer only series and then they added started adding the single player and they were worthless and a joke so the only place where I could where I could see a legitimate argument for lack of content relative to those games uh, is there. They talk about and may this is still a maybe to me. People are talking about how there's only eleven weapons in the game, and there's something like forty five weapons or more, fifty uh, something weapons in the battlefield games. And I and I will acquiesce to that. Although the system is set up very differently, where you have these star cards uh, and you you uh, choose your star cards loadouts and that sort of thing. Um, so, you know, I, that's the one place where I could see sort of less content. Now, people who are upset, there are people who are upset because it lacks content relative to the old Star Wars Battlefront. I, I understand that. Um, and I even understand if people think this isn't enough content and what you get for your money is bullshit in terms of the season pass. I understand that. What I don't understand is how nobody is talking. And I mean, nobody is taught. They're, they're talking about it in the media and on our website, in my opinion, like, like this is the first time this has happened. This is the exact model they have followed in Battlefield 3 and 4. This is not new to Battlefront. So it, it's and, just been and a, so, a... And the implication being that people did not voice this kind of... this Or this level of objection when it happened in the case of, like, Battlefield 3 and 4. Correct. Okay. Yes, that's exactly correct. And now everything seems to be about how there's not enough content in, battle, in, uh, in Battlefront. Um, so, uh, you know... Uh, uh, again, I mean, I don't begrudge people having their opinions, but I do think that it's the same amount of content. I understand why people think a $50 season pass is ridiculous. I will say that in the context of Battlefield 3 and 4, you know, I put upwards over 200 hours into Battlefield 3, and so paying uh, what was ultimately $110 for the game seems more than fair to me. Um, yeah. And I go back to, Brent, I've said this before, I will say it again, my metric, this is just my metric, my metric for value in a video game is base it, it's it's the amount of money it costs to go see a movie. So we go see a movie, we pay twelve, fourteen dollars for a two hour experience, and we have no compunction doing so. I never hear anybody complain that movies are too expensive. And so that's how I even though they that? are. Uh that's how I look at that's I don't think they are. I mean I think twelve twelve dollars is a fair amount for a for a uh very good movie going experience. Um so if I get 6 or $7 an hour of entertainment out of my video game, 
uh, I feel like I've gotten my money's worth. So, which is to say, if I if I pay full price for a video game, and I get a good ten or eleven hours or twelve hours of like joyful content, I feel like I've gotten my money's worth. And anything on top of that is gravy. And I think we've gotten to this point where, and, and I don't quite understand it, like what the division is, right? Because I play a game like, for example, um, Until Dawn, twelve hour game, whatever, paid full price for it. Absolutely loved it. Okay. Uh, and there are people who will, or Uncharted is another example. Yeah. Maybe 15 hours worth of gameplay. Totally love it. But so, for some reason, we feel like with this type of game, if we don't get greater than 50 hours of pure entertainment, then we're being fucked. Yeah. And, and I don't quite understand why that is. Like, wh- why that expectation is one way for a certain type of game, but not for another. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, th- th- that's an interesting, uh, th- that's an interesting question. And I, I you know, my only my only response, without thinking about it a little bit more, would be that obviously the amount of time you get out of it must not be the only factor that people are that, that people are, are measuring into it, or you know they're, they're just not they're 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 not considering the the time factor in those other games that you talked about and and all that. But yeah, I don't know. I think it's interesting. So 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 I have been enjoying it, Brent. Um, I've been playing a lot of, uh, now certainly it has its downfalls, I think. And, and I've, I, so it was really fun for the first three or four days. Right. And then it, it sort of took a little bit of a dive for me, honestly. And I posted about this on the website. I went from being like, at, just for the purposes of explanation, I went from being, you know, roughly five and five in every game that I played. I was about middle of the road, uh, to all of a sudden being like two and eight really? in every game. And, and is that, is that I, so matchmaking you think? I think it is. It now, I, 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 in retrospect, I mean, certainly people have ebbs and flows, but it was very sure. stark, and it wasn't just me. It was my buddy, uh, who's actually better at shooters than I am, uh, had the exact same experience. I mean, it just was uh, like almost immediately, to all of a sudden, we're, we're playing this game, and we're like, well, what the fuck happened in this game in the last 24 hours that all of a sudden we're just getting like just fucking pummeled, and every match I'm playing, we're losing 5 nothing, 5 nothing. You know, five nothing. You know, in the case of the drop zone, um, as opposed to uh, you know it being a two to two or a three to three kind of match. And so, um, I think the game's got matchmaking problems. I do think there's a um, there, there's a problem in the game that just absolutely drives me batshit, which is that there's no punishment uh, for um, no no uh, accuracy punishment for moving during the game. So when you're playing on PC, the way that plays out is people just strafe side to side side to side side to side right it's it's almost the equivalent of bunny hopping right (laughs) so typically when you hit they just literally press a d a d a d a d and like hop back and forth left to right and typically when you do that there's a penalty to your accuracy and so you can't play that way right this game hasn't figured that out yet so i hope they fix that um i certainly would like to see some more blasters although i do think people i saw comments about how there's only 11 guns and most of them are the same and i i do disagree with that um uh, but it, Brent, it is, I mean, it is phenomenally gorgeous. It is a lot of fun and it is, uh, it feels like being in star Wars, the sights, the sounds, everything about it, I think is just fantastic. And I've put about 18 hours into this point. Um, and I certainly, uh, expect to put more hours into it and I won't, I don't know. I'm not saying I'm going to do this, but, but I wouldn't be surprised if I ended up getting the DLC, uh, particularly if they announced like Cloud City and the Death Star and Lando, and yeah. I-, I could see myself potentially maybe you know getting the DLC if not initially maybe down the road, uh, because again with with uh, with Battlefront Three, uh, I paid for the DLC and, and I had no problem with it because I played the hell out of it. So if my friends and I keep playing, um, uh, I-, I I would you know potentially be open to that idea. I am absolutely enjoying it. It's a fun run and gun shooter. It is a little. Um, it's a little easier to get into, I think, for, for folks that aren't like experienced shooter players, uh, which I think is a positive thing. Uh, but I, yeah, no, I'm absolutely enjoying it. Absolutely enjoying it. And I, and I, I don't know if you'll like it or not, just because you tend, you don't tend to play FPS multiplayer games. Yep. Um, but you're so into Star Wars that it's it's a it's a fun game. I loved the beta. I had a really really great time with it, as you recall. And my whole my only hesitance about picking up the game is just whether or not I would have time to play during the same periods of time that you are playing, you know, whether we would be able to play right. together. together. Cause yeah. it, and that, that's one thing that I've heard, you know, people who have talked about the game and enjoyed it. They say it's great, but you know, it's really, really good with friends. 
And, it is, and um, it's a game that does require some. I play objective based games, yeah. So I play Drop uh, Drop Pod. I play uh, Supremacy. Um, are the two that I like. It, it is cr- cr- screaming out for a conquest mode, which is basically uh, they have a a droid mode, which is like a mini version of conquest. It's there's these droids in three areas, and you capture the the and hold try and hold the point. Yeah. Only the droid moves around. That's the sort of twist on it. Um, they need that with larger maps, so there's five uh, the way Conquest is in Battlefield 3. Um, but this is a game that really, really requires team play. Uh, and so playing with people you know where you're on the headset with them and somewhat coordinating makes a big, big difference. Yeah, yeah. Although I will say, this is the most fun I think I've ever had playing a multiplayer first-person shooter, like a multiplayer shooter, um, when I play alone, which is I didn't typically play alone with other games. Right. I find myself playing this one alone and having a good time. So there you go. <laughs> All right. Well, let's go ahead. No, and- nothing. No, no playing with yourself joke. <laughs> you want to head on into the sunset? If we're going to head into the sunset, I'm Brent, slipping uh, in my old age, apparently. Thanks. Thanks to you. Uh, I am. My end of the sunset is also about Battlefront. I hadn't seen this. Actually, you brought this to my attention. Yeah. This was discovered by Kotaku. Uh, it's an Easter egg in Battlefront. And there's some neat little Easter eggs. There's nothing. Dude, there's nothing more awesome than being in this in the Tatooine map uh, and seeing the Jawas run into their cave or so. it's so f- cool um the uh the easter egg that i'm referring to you guys just need to go watch it it's an easter egg of a stormtrooper hitting their head on the death star uh they in they put uh, an easter egg in the game kotaku discovered Those it it's absolutely brilliant out of i mean come on it's, it's brilliant you just need to just go read this it's it's got both videos of the original movie plus uh how battlefront honored that moment it's funny as hell yeah man uh my end of the sunset is actually a follow-up on uh, the the threat I made last week to uh, to go and and pull the uh, pull the trigger on a an MGS five Let's Play detailing this you know this whole thing I went through with Episode nine back up back down and my quest to get a hundred percent of the objectives and an S rank in a single playthrough without destroying any of the armored vehicles involved in that mission and uh, I did it uh, over the weekend actually I, I did it twice I. You know, I got the I got that new Elgato capture card, and I was like, "Well, this is the perfect uh, this is the perfect thing to try it out on." So, I did a couple of run throughs over the weekend and managed to uh, managed to pull it off. And I've got that on YouTube now, and you can go uh, check it out if you uh, <laughs> if you feel like descending into the madness of uh, of my my Metal Gear Wonderland. Uh, you, can, you are a, you're a sick man, is you what know, you it, are. It, 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 like you know, because I've got to go back and edit it. You know, like I've you know like adding titles. You know, some of that kind of. St- Thing. Yeah, so you got to go back and like watch it, you know, just to make sure there are no glitches or whatever. And I was sitting there watching it and kind of going like, like, there, like, there's this one point where I'm talking about, uh, like, I'm I'm doing this and I'm doing this, and I come around this corner, I'm like, oh, this t- this tank is like, it's getting here much much faster than it's supposed to. This is, you know, what the fuck is going on? Like, obviously, I've screwed up my system, like, you know, because it's not going exactly the way that I want it to, and. You know, I'm just like uh, I'm talking about how like you know, like all oh, the timings off here. Like this guy's getting here too soon, and this guy's getting here too late. And I'm like, I've I've been playing this mission a lot. <laughs> yeah. It's time to move. Yeah. It's time to move it, on. It, it's a sickness for sure. Mm-hmm. Uh, all right, in the uh, in our ride along this week, we only had a couple of offerings up in the ride along this week. So, uh, but we did have some good ones. And Lavitz uh, writes in greetings, Axe Lord. I mean, fellow outlaws. It's okay. Uh, Recently, I've been finding a few articles on digital game sales and how they still seem to pale in comparison to their physical counterparts. Some even going so far as to attribute said discrepancy in numbers to consumers preferring the physical version. But I want to bring up another possible explanation. I've been buying the digital versions of games more and more, but find that they are, in fact, more expensive than the physical versions. We talked about this earlier. Just a few days ago, while I was searching for Fallout 4 for the PS4, uh, for example, in the PSN store, it cost sixty nine ninety nine euros. But after just a couple of minutes, I ended up ordering the same game on Amazon for around fifty three euros. Now, I want to buy the digital. Ver- I wanted to buy the digital version, but ended up going with the physical one to save money. Do you feel like this might be one of the reasons digital game sales on consoles seem to have not taken off yet? And what are your thoughts on the price of digital storefronts versus brick and mortar? Stay sharp, <laughs> my friends. Well, Lavitz, we gave you an entire. Uh, Entire- I was going to say I was going to say what we're reading section. Ah. We gave you an entire clubhouse section to answer that question and yes, I do think that this is part of why um digital sales are not as big on consoles as they could be and certainly not as big as they are on PC. Right. So there you have it. Uh that is going to do it Brent for this week's episode. As usual, we want to yes, hear indeed. what you guys 
Think about everything we talked about on the show this week, whether it was Metal Gear Solid Five, Star Wars Battlefront, Rocket League, Fallout Shelter, what we talked about up in the clubhouse and in the ride-along about digital uh, sales and profit margins and how that's not being passed on to the consumer. And then finally up in the garage, the PlayStation 2 emulation potentially coming to PS4, uh, the change in the... S- in the structure of the Steam sales, Crytek's Back to Dinosaur Island VR game, which is currently on Steam for the DK2, and the delay of Deus Ex Mankind Divided. We want to hear your thoughts on those or any topics related to gaming. As usual, he is Brent Adams. I am Lauren Baumgarten. And remember, you don't stop playing because you get old. You get old because you stop playing. <laughs> <laughs>